Thank you so much, Aika, for reading the story of Zacchaeus to us. I wonder how many of us have put ourselves in the shoes of Zacchaeus, who had such a deep, meaningful longing for God that he climbed up a sycamore tree uh, because the, the Lord he wanted to see. Uh, makes me think about the news story uh, that we had this week of a very famous sycamore tree that was cut down by vandals. Did you see that in the news? Um, absolutely painful and tragic to see that. Interesting, I, I've got such good memories because my wife and I uh, took a holiday. Was it just during, during lockdown or was it? Oh. Yeah, between the two lockdowns and we were somewhere um, between where I lived in the south and we stopped and we decided Hadrian's Wall will be what we explore. And we took a walk. We heard about this tree uh, and we took a walk and it was further than we thought it would be up and down, up and down. And uh, but I caught my photo with my wife walking under the tree. <laughs> uh, so this week it was really sad to hear about it. Um, that, but Jesus, I think um, Zacchaeus climbed into a similar tree. Uh, short man feeling unable to meet God, to meet a savior, unworthy to meet a savior. And I wonder how many of us feel unable and unworthy and we, we we're not sure if god really really accepts us and then uh, jesus comes and he looks up into that tree <laughs> and he says zacchaeus you didn't know it but i i came near looking for you and i'm gonna come and i'm gonna eat i'm gonna dine with you i'm gonna sit around the table and I'm going to share food and we're going to just be with each other. And Zacchaeus uh, just can't believe it. And communion is very much what this is all about. It's sitting around the table when we didn't know that we were worthy guests to be invited to spend time with God. And what does Zacchaeus do? I love the, the words of the song we just sang, which says, uh, um, but drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Yea, Lord, I give myself away, just all that I can do. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus does. He says, I can, I can feel terrible about what I've done, about all the things that I've stolen from people. I will give it back. But what does he give more than that? He gives his whole life to God. And the communion for today is an invitation for all of us to once again recommit and to give everything that we have away to God. And so if you'll allow me, I'll, can I spend just a few minutes to explore what the meaning of these symbols are? Um, Auntie Simone is going to do a little bit of that with the children as well while we go and we wash our feet. But as you know, communion has two sections to it, especially in the Adventist church. The, the first section people find quite strange. Uh, it's not many churches who actually do that. It's one of my favorite bits when I meet a new a person who wants to become a Seventh-day Adventist. I say to them, we've got the most amazing thing that we do when we do communion. And they wonder what it is and we say we take Jesus seriously when he says I want you to wash each other's feet um, and uh, to me it's so exciting and then of course the second part is the sharing of the communal meal um, um, so let's just talk about the foot washing we find it strange today and there's a reason for it uh, that we find it strange. It's because we live in a time when there's where most of the time before 
we go to church on a Sabbath morning. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't ask, but has anybody had a shower this morning or this evening, <laughs> last night? <laughs> I can see a bit of that. Uh, it's quite interesting uh, that it, we are quite used to the fact that we take showers once a day, sometimes two times a day. The other day, in fact, I learned something new. Uh, you will wonder what under which rock I was born that I didn't know this. Uh, I was looking for somebody to cut my hair. And usually I just go into one of the, the local shops over here, one of the Turkish hairdressers, and I have it done. And they usually just come like a... Um, um, and they just take it all away. And I wonder what happened afterwards. I had a fight with a lawnmower and I kind of lost it. And so the other day, without thinking, I decided I'm going to just walk a little bit further down Union Street. And on the left-hand side, I walked into a, a, a barber shop. And I thought, well, this is a smart place. Maybe I made a mistake. Uh, to walk in there. And do you know what? I, I probably did make a mistake because I paid twice as much for the haircut <laughs> than I do at the Turkish um, barber. But as the guy was cutting my hair, and I could see he was an expert, he was, as I was talking, he said that his dream is to open a hair a barber shop where he teaches people how to barber and he follows Instagram and he knows all the new styles. And I just knew I was in professional hands. And he looked at my hair and says, your hair is very soft. Uh, do you wash your hair every day? I say, yes, I've, I always wash my hair every single day. He says, don't do that. <laughs> uh, he says, your, your scalp has natural oils that that feed your hair and if every every time you wash it you uh you and i i didn't know that my i went home and told my wife she says that's exactly what we always have to do we can't wash our hair every day it destroys everything she says your hair will even change color probably if you don't wash your hair so i've been experimenting with it uh, i won't tell reveal whether i washed it this morning or not but Anyway, um, so we're so used to washing ourselves every single day and being clean. And then when we're clean, we go to a, a function and we arrive smelling fresh, looking good, um, uh, except for some of us who can never look good. Uh, but then what happens with Jesus and them in their time? Is ablutions aren't always that easily available, but they do wash once or twice a week. But then if you go to a special function, you have to walk there and you've got sandals and you've got all of the dust that you have to kick up. And by the time that you get to the function, you actually are all, you're sweaty, you're dirty, your feet have layers of dirt and mud and and uh, and you just don't feel very clean and refreshed. And so the bathing practices in those times was you bath when you get to the place rather than when you when you leave your home. <laughs> I wish I could do that because, you know, it, I would have cycled to church this morning if there was a shower that I could quickly jump in. But <laughs> but um, and so Jesus and his disciples arrive at their place where they were going to celebrate the Passover meal as they always do. And suddenly the realization dawns on all of them that there's nobody to wash their feet. Uh, and, th and they think, oh no, this was an oversight. This isn't going to be a very pleasant meal together if we haven't got our feet. And the disciples are still looking around and they're arguing amongst each other and the next moment, Jesus takes his cloak off, he puts a towel around his waist, and then he begins. He, he kneels down and he, he begins to massage and wash and clean. He takes a basin, his disciples' feet. And so there's two things that jump out for me from that. The, the, the first one is just the service idea. You know, the disciples were probably arguing amongst each other. Who's going to do it? 
I don't want to do that. Uh, I wonder how often that happens in our lives and in our churches where we expect somebody else to serve us. Uh, uh, we, we come, to, I, I'm guilty of this, I come home some days uh, and I just wish that there was some food that was already prepared. And I look at my wife and I say, are you going to prepare the food? Now, she's had a busy day teaching at school. I've been busy. And then I kind of wish that I could just say to her, well, you, you need to do it. <laughs> uh, but oftentimes, I think um, you'll have to ask her, but I think we're quite good at it. I do it sometimes, uh, once a month or so. Uh, <laughs> A little bit more regularly there. And if you find that there's a church where there's conflict and where there's some difficulty, it's often because you've come to the point where we've forgotten what it, that God has called us to be servants. Um, um, because then I become the Lord and I need to be able to tell people what they need to do but uh, heaven forbid that I need to do it uh, myself to make it make it work. And in our families, that also happens sometimes. And Jesus comes uh, with this foot washing, and he says, uh, "You can, uh, your, uh, I was a servant." Do you remember that famous verse in Second Philippians, Philippians chapter two? It says he didn't think equality with God, something worthy to be grasped. But he humbled himself and became a servant um, for us. Uh, so much so that he was such a servant that he gave up his life. And because of that, God has exalted Jesus to the highest place. So our exaltation can only come on a route that goes through service. And that's what uh, foot washing is all about. And, and Jesus portrays us for us. He washes the feet. And then the second thing about foot washing, um, you know, as G, um, is the cleansing that comes with it. And, you know, I wonder how your feet are. My feet are extremely sensitive. If anybody wants to touch them, they need to be very careful <laughs> because otherwise... Um, because your feet kind of affect the rest of your body. I don't know if you've discovered that. So if, you're, if your feet are cold, then your whole body feels cold. Am I right? If, you're, if your feet um, um, are warm, then you feel nice and warm and comfortable. Uh, uh, there's this practice of reflexology. If I can massage a big toe, uh, this is not medical advice. I don't know where it goes, but it could make your liver feel better. Um, <laughs> if you massage the heel of your foot, it might make your your headache go away or um, wherever that is. And so Jesus washes the feet and he cleanses his disciples. But washing the feet symbolizes cleansing the whole person for where they can be. So I heard a story just recently, and we've all experienced similar situations of a woman who approached a minister and said to the minister, uh, uh, I've got some guilt issues that I need to deal with. And she tells about the divorce that they went through and it wasn't an amicable divorce it was one where there was lots of aggravation and upsetness and both parties played a role in it but um, the woman came back she says i feel so guilty because my my and the minister actually said to her you can you can ask for forgiveness um, because of the way that you've done things and she said, no, I can't, because the ex-husband has now passed away. Um, and she feels like she didn't manage things right in that situation. And at that moment, the pastor had a moment of inspiration. And he said to the lady, you know, there is a way that you can ask for forgiveness. And that is you can go to, the, in two weeks' time, there's going to be a communion service. Take somebody that you trust 
a very close friend and invite them to come and wash each other's feet. And then when you wash uh, that lady's feet and when she washes your feet, confess your sins to her. Uh, confess the situation that you went through and just ask her to pray for you before she washes your feet. And, and, in the post, and she went and did it and she says, she came back and told the pastor, that helped me just to put that whole chapter behind me and to find peace with God and to know that God has forgiven me to wash away the sins. Um, many communion services, have you, you grew up hearing pastors preach communion? Uh, you, you actually make the announcement the week before the time and say, take a little bit of time and just reflect on your own life. We're not very good at confession in our church often. We're, we're good at praise. We're good at saying what we're good at. We're, we're good at uh, uh, doing things. But how good are we at coming to God and saying, my life hasn't quite gone the way that it should have gone. And, and you know, foot washing is, when I get baptized, I give my life to God and he washes my whole body, washes all my sins away. But the fact of the matter is we all pick up sin as we go along the way. We pick up this dirt, we pick up these painful experiences. But, and then when we go and we wash our feet, it is an opportunity for us to wash all that sin away. It's like being baptized again. It's like being cleansed again and where we can be. So foot washing is about service and helping and being caring for each other but it's also about just asking god to cleanse us for where we can be and so then the communion part the, the meal where zacchaeus comes and he said to, to me that's an absolutely uh, amazing bit I remember as a, as a teenager uh I found foot washing quite challenging. I didn't always enjoy it. <laughs> I felt so self-conscious about things. I wish that I could do um, my the, the, the communion without foot washing. And probably you can, but I think you lose a lot of what happens. Um, so the, the bread is again, Jesus comes and he prays over the bread and he breaks it. Um, but the big thing that happens with the bread is that there's a transaction that takes place. And it's a transaction that's very complicated. Uh, throughout history, there's been lots of debate about this bread. You know, if you are in the Catholic Church, you believe that when you break the bread, what actually happens when the priest pronounces a blessing on that bread, uh, there's a big word for it. It's called transubstantiation. Have you heard about that? Now that bread becomes the physical body of Christ that, that you have to eat. And now we fall in the Protestant tradition where we say, no, actually not. It's a symbol. Uh, so it, what happens is when we break the bread, it symbolizes the fact that Jesus' body was broken for us. But I think the big thing that it does is it tells us, it tries to recapture what happened when Jesus died for us on the cross. And the, that transaction that happened on the cross is something that, uh, is it Ellen White says, we should spend an hour every day contemplating it and asking ourselves what happened because we find it really difficult to understand because on the one hand, you've got God's law of love. On the other hand, you've got God's anger with sin. And these things play themselves out on the cross. And somehow in between all of that, you get a strand of mercy that comes out. It's like a narrow way that leads to salvation, um, some, some challenge. And, and so, and we, I don't think we'll unpick all of that today, but communion is very much remembering what Jesus does for us on the cross and trying to find that connection uh, with, with, with God and with what God has done for us. The, other, the last thing about the communion before I finish is this table again. 
And again, it's a story that many people have told in different ways and have experienced. But I remember uh, in the first church that I pastored in South Africa, there was a family that had 12 children. Uh, anybody here that's from a family with 12? There's one. Yeah, there is. <laughs> There's another one. It's, it's quite bigger than 12. <laughs> There's one that's bigger than 12. Amazing. <laughs> 15. 16. 16. <laughs> There's something really special about that. It, <laughs> the, uh, the way in which those families communicate. But in this particular family, there was, there was school principal in the family. There was a, there was uh, some people who were businessmen. Uh, others were looking after their uh, the, um, household executives, housewives, etc. But um, there was one young man in that family <clears throat> who wasn't always at the meal to, with them when they celebrated. The, in South Africa, it would be the Christmas meal that they would celebrate. And mum in that family would always say, where's John? <laughs> And sometimes the family would be worried because they would have to say, John isn't here because he's in prison. Um, or John isn't here because uh, actually he's, he's got other priorities at the moment. He's using a little bit too much uh, drugs and he's not feeling well and he's caught up in ways. And mum, her face would fall because... Eleven children are there, but there's one that's missing. <clears throat> but on the days, on the Christmases, when John appeared at home, mother would be happy. Uh, mother would be rejoicing and mother would be at peace because her baby boy is with her at the table. And I think to me that's just a beautiful picture of what communion is about. Um, we sang that song, Seeking the Lost, uh, kindly entreating um, for the sinners to come back home. And so communion is very much God wanting you and me to be at the table. And God won't be at peace if we're not at the table, if we can't eat together. And his invitation to you is that you can be here today and we can celebrate what is going to happen. And that's the end of my presentation.